Go ready. Good morning. Uh, today, November 15, 2020, I have to report to Washingtonians is the most dangerous public health day in over 100 years in our state's great history. It is troublesome, but I must report that we have a pandemic raging across our state, abroad across our state, that is a potentially fatal disease. Left unchecked, it will assuredly result in grossly overburdened hospitals. It will keep people from receiving routine but necessary medical treatment because of the stresses our hospitals will be under. Left unchecked, the economic devastation long-term will be continually prolonged. And most importantly, left unchecked, we will see continued untold numbers of deaths. We will not allow these things to happen. Now, we know we've seen previously two waves of growth of this pandemic in our state. This is the third wave. And uh, if you look at this shot on your screen, Sam, I believe this is up. Now we're facing a third wave that is trending to be more dangerous than any we have seen before. Inaction here is not an option. We have to take bold, decisive action and we are doing that today. Average daily cases in our state have doubled just in the last two weeks. It cannot go on like this. We have to get this under control or our medical system will soon be overwhelmed. More people will get sick, sometimes with prolonged problems, and more people will lose their lives. We now have new uh, record daily numbers uh, that have surpassed anything or equal of any time during the pandemic. And as we can see on a chart that I hope Sam will put up, we have seen these numbers go up at a very, very steep rate, as the indicating chart indicates. And the unfortunate thing about this chart is that this will continue to go up at just as steep a rate left unchecked. That's why inaction is not an option here. So all along, we have been uh, focused uh, to keeping our hospital system working has been a top concern for us. If the exponential growth of COVID-19 continues unmitigated, Anyone who is afflicted with even kind of a need for routine treatment may not be able to get it because the hospitals will be full of people with COVID. So those today, if you, if you were sure you're never going to get COVID, but you might be concerned needing uh, a new hip or a knee or a cardiac operation or cancer, you're at risk if we do not get on top of the COVID pandemic because we would have to avoid doing some of those other procedures. <clears throat> Yesterday, there were more than 2,286 uh, cases. This is a record for our state. And preliminary numbers from the Department of Health this morning suggest that we will unfortunately break that record again today. Now, I'd like to put this in context of where we are relative to this pandemic. We are today in a more dangerous position than we were in March when our first stay-at-home order was issued. We are in a more dangerous position due to a combination of the extent of this virus, which is now in, throughout the state and the nation, and because of the situation we are heading into the winter months. In March, we were heading into the summer months, and we were largely successful relative to other states because of a combination that we acted early, we did not wait. And the one thing about this virus that every epidemiologist and virologist have told us is early action can save the day. We acted early. We also had the benefit we were heading to summer where people could be outside more. But now we're heading inside and we're heading into the virus's uh, home arena. 
This is where the virus gets us, inside, where we're heading during the winter. So the time has come to reinstate some of the restrictions on activities statewide to preserve our well-being and to save lives. Now, the choices we have announced today are not easy ones, I can tell you that. But I do believe they are the right choices given the threat that we face. I know it isn't easy. I share your frustration that we are back facing another wave. It would have been wonderful if we could have totally eliminated this. But we know from earlier this year, this, and I think this should give us confidence, there are things we can do that work. We have done this once or twice before. So we know that if we continue to exercise a diligence, that we can continue to knock this down. So today, if I talk about what we will be doing uh, by an executive order uh, today. So accordingly, I'm announcing a series of measures that will give us reasonable hope that the success we enjoyed last spring can be replicated uh, in, uh, in reducing the horrific rate of transmission where we were relatively successful compared to other states that did not take early action like we did this spring. As I said, we know these measures can work. We've showed the country that they can work. So the restrictions we're announcing today, which will be in effect through December 14th, are not as comprehensive or to some degree tough as our stay home order in March. But every part of our state will see rollbacks in some sense. Most will take effect at, uh, at uh, midnight Monday. But this is not forever. This is only for now. Thanks to the brilliance of our medical community, a vaccine is on the way. We need to hold this pandemic down until the Calvary arrives. This is a temporary situation in our state where we seek a permanent healthy condition. And our goal is to keep the most people alive as possible until the vaccine and other therapeutic measures arrives. And that's a task I believe Washington is up to. So here are some parts of our plan. Uh, indoor social gatherings with people from outside your home are prohibited unless they quarantine for 14 days prior to the social gathering or quarantine for the seven days prior to the gathering and receive a negative COVID-19 test result no more than 48 hours prior to the gathering. This is an important part of our efforts because we know where this virus can get you and that's in your own home or your friend's home at a dinner party, at a get together, at a birthday party, at a Seahawks celebration any of those events can end up being deadly. Outdoor gatherings are limited to no more than five people. Uh, restaurants and bars are closed for indoor service. Outdoor dining with capacity restrictions and to go or takeout services are still allowed under this uh, rule. In-store retail, which includes grocery stores, is limited to 25% of occupancy and must close any congregate areas such as food courts uh, in malls. Religious services will be limited to 25% of indoor capacity or 200 people, whichever is less. And choirs, bands, or ensembles are prohibited from performing. Now, I know that in plenty of communities and church services and singing are inextricably linked. And I understand and appreciate how much song can lift our spirits. A solo performances are allowed under this plan, but because of the way the virus travels through our breathing and our singing, it's just too risky indoors uh, for choirs right now. Uh, we've already provided a list, full list of the restrictions to the media and stakeholders, and you'll be able to find those uh, on our website as well. But I'd like to talk about what makes these activities risky. The decisions we have made have been based on science, the science of this virus, the science of what conditions lead to its transmission, and the recognition of what works, because we've done these things before, frankly. We can very confidently assume where the risk is based on the science of how this disease spreads. It is most likely to be 
transmitted indoors where people are not wearing masks, where they come into relatively close contact, and where they spend a good amount of time, such as a restaurant or a gym, or potentially a store that are unmasked. These are scientific facts. They're indisputable. Anywhere there, those conditions exist is a risk of transmission, anywhere. And anywhere that we can reduce the number of those uh, conditions that exist is a way to reduce the transmission rate in the state of Washington in any environment. So I want to address the, uh, the business impacts. Uh, and they are significant. We know this. Look, people have been hurt by previous restrictions. We've seen people laid off because of previous restrictions due to this pandemic during the spring. We've, been, we've seen some businesses that have not been able to survive. And every single one of those employees and business owners uh, deserve uh, a real feeling of empathy of what they're going through. I feel it right here. These are folks I know. And anybody who's unemployed because of this, even if we can help them, and we intend to do so, that I'll talk about in a minute, it's still terribly traumatic to these families. And we ought to be cognizant of that. And we ought to make decisions that are as unobtrusive to some degree as possible in this regard, and that's what we have done. But we have recognized that what is at stake here, which is life itself. And we're making some hard decisions in that regard. So this is the COVID pandemic is not just a public health crisis, it is an economic crisis as well. And on how we have fashioned a plan needs to recognize both of those things. We cannot take lightly the impact on businesses in, re in this regard. But this is clear. We also cannot enjoy a full economic recovery, which we all desperately want, without knocking down this virus. That is an economic principle we have to realize as well. So to the business owners and the employees right now, I want you to know you're not alone. You have 7 million people. We're going to look for every way to help you through this difficult time. During the pandemic, my office, in partnership with the legislatures and cities and counties, have distributed $25 million in grants to, saw, to small businesses, and that has saved thousands of jobs. We've also provided uh, $100 million for rental assistance. And today I'm announcing another effort to reduce the hardship of this uh, pandemic that is brought to business and workers. And I'm committing another $50 million to help mitigate impacts on businesses and workers. And we fully intend to get that money out as soon as possible. This will be in grants, combination of grants and loans before the end of the year. And we're doing some pretty creative work in, in being able to do that and leverage some other dollars as well. I'll have more to say about that in the upcoming weeks and days. So we're gonna work with our partners to get this aid out as swiftly as we can. Um, to folks who have been bitten by this. But we know that is not enough. This is not going to ameliorate all the economic suffering by a long shot. But it's what we've been able to do so far. And I'm going to redouble my efforts, and I hope everybody who's listening to this will redouble your efforts to get the federal government to step up to the plate. We have some big problems because unemployment compensation, which has been so important, uh, will run out uh, fairly shortly. And the Congress has not reinstituted the business support plan yet. It needs to do both those things. Uh, Washingtonians, Americans deserve that. And we ought to continue to lift our insistence that they get that job done. Uh, but we are also looking at some alternatives if the federal government does not. And I will be talking to legislators about other alternatives to help businesses and help employees if, in fact, the Congress does not act. Uh, I do know, I want to say that employers who have not yet used the Paycheck Protection Plan forgivable loans, businesses can still apply through the Small Business Administration at their local bank. We are going to regrow our economy. I'm very confident of that, in part because we created the best economy in the state, in the country, before COVID hit us. And I believe we are going to knock down this virus. But we need to act today. Today's announcement does not change our guidance for child care services or for K-12 through education. 
That guidance and its recommendations will remain in place for now. We know child care is critical, especially for essential and frontline workers. And we know how critical education is for our young folks. So far, the experience with schools in Washington and across the nation show that health and safety measures, when rigorously enforced, can limit COVID transmission in the school environment. At this time, we are not asking districts currently offering in-person instruction to close unless the local health officer advises them to change course and the local school board makes that decision, as you know. Uh, we have some guest speakers today. I'm very pleased we have uh, a State Health Officer Dr. Kathy Lofi, a Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin, King County Executive Dow Constantine. We're also joined by Dr. George Diaz of the Providence Health uh, Center in Everett and Clint Wallace, an ICU nurse in the COVID unit at Sacred Heart Medical Center in Spokane. So Dr. Lofi. Well, thank you, Governor Inslee, and good morning, everyone. The current trajectory of this pandemic has put us in a really difficult position as a state, as the governor just mentioned. Um, we don't make these decisions lightly, um, so I do want to talk to you all a little bit about the rationale behind some of the new restrictions that the governor just announced. So first, we are extremely concerned about how quickly COVID-19 is spreading through our state. Um, we have entered a phase of accelerated or exponential growth of the outbreak. Um, as the governor mentioned, during the past two weeks, the number of cases reported each day in our state has more than doubled from about 1,000 cases reported per day to more than 2,200 cases reported per day. Um, if that doubling time continues, in two more weeks, we'll be seeing over 4,000 cases per day. Um, especially concerning um, is that during the past week, the number of patients currently in our hospitals with COVID-19 increased about 40% from 401 on November 6th to 566 on November 13th. This next slide uh, demonstrates that this is a statewide problem. We have high disease rates throughout the state as indicated in the dark orange. Um, and many counties are seeing a dramatic uptick in disease activity. This increase is simply not sustainable. We will eventually exceed the capacity in our hospitals to adequately care for all patients, um, including patients with and without COVID, and ultimately will lead to more deaths. When cases are accelerating, we need to act early because the effects of the measures that we put in place this week um, will not be shown in the data for another three weeks. So we don't want to wait um, until we are dark red on the map that is uh, that you can currently see. That is too late. Second, I want to talk to you all about the rationale for the specific measures the governor just announced. Over the course of the pandemic, we've learned a lot about how this virus is transmitted. We initially thought it was spread primarily through large droplets that only traveled a few feet in the air and rapidly fell to the ground. We now know that this virus can also spread through very small droplets called aerosols that are expelled from our mouths when we talk, cough, sneeze, and sing, um, and can linger in the air. We also know that a primary risk factor for spreading the virus is contact with an infected person in indoor spaces. The infection risk increases with the duration and the proximity of contact with an infected individual, with certain activities, when masks are not worn, and where ventilation is not good. The CDC recently acknowledged growing evidence that droplets and airborne particles can remain suspended in the air and travel distances beyond six feet during choir practice, in restaurants, and in fitness classes. Many of the measures the governor is taking today are intended to reduce opportunities for prolonged close contact indoors with people outside of our household. Even though we know more about how the virus spreads, in many cases, it's not possible to pinpoint exactly where COVID-19 is being transmitted in our communities. And this problem is not unique to Washington State. When we interview cases, it's often difficult to determine with certainty where the individual was infected because they often have more than one potential exposure. 
And because many people may not remember all their activities in the 14 days before becoming ill or may not wanna share all their activities with us. Occasionally we can identify where two or more people have been infected, which we consider an outbreak. But these identified outbreaks likely only represent a portion of transmission that's occurring in the community and will likely only detect, uh, and we likely are only detecting a fraction of these outbreaks. So with limited data on where transmission is occurring in Washington, we also rely on the science around how the virus is spread and reports of outbreak investigations from other areas. Our leading national infectious disease experts at the D Infectious Disease Society of America have stated that eating indoors in restaurants, going to an indoor gym, attending a church service with singing, going to bars, and going to movie theaters are activities that put us at high risk for spread of COVID-19. A recent CDC study also reported that dining in a restaurant, bar, or coffee shop was associated with an increased risk for COVID-19. Flattening this curve is essential to saving lives and ensuring that our hospitals don't become overwhelmed with COVID cases like we're seeing in many hospitals in the Midwest um, and elsewhere in the country. If we act now, we can be successful. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Governor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lofi, and thanks for your steadfast science uh, throughout these efforts. I, re I have really appreciated it. Uh, we now have uh, Clint Wallace who is with uh, an ICU nurse at the Sacred Heart Medical Center in Spokane. Clint, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Governor. Thanks for having me. I'm just here to speak on behalf of a lot of the nurses and healthcare workers throughout the state. We've been in this pandemic for eight months now and we are exhausted. We are tired. Hospital preparedness is more about having beds and ventilators. It's about having adequate staffing and staff that are have the energy to take care of these patients. These patients require more than a normal patient. They require continuous monitoring. They require a change of PPE, both entering the room and leaving the room. It's critical that hospitals and the community listen to other healthcare workers and what they need to do to protect, to safely care for our patients. We're close as a whole and healthcare workers to being burnt out. And we are pleading with the community of Washington and throughout the world to follow the directions and advice of our healthcare experts. I've been an ICU nurse for close to 20 years now, and this is as busy as I've seen it. Our capacity for staff is uh, exceeding 100%. It's been difficult for staff for so long and we are, we have used our emotions, our physical abilities, our vacation time for the last eight months. And we are needing the community to pull together. We're needing everyone to put aside their political and financial uh, motives and follow the directions of our, of our health experts. We need help. We need everybody's help. Thank you, Governor. Well, thank you, Clint. And uh, I know you have about seven million. appreciate the heroism of you and your colleagues throughout the medical system. It's been extraordinary to see what you do every day. And uh, I, for one, think that's a fair request that to help you out a, a little bit here. And uh, I hope people will do so yeah, because we know you are, uh, you know, kind of at the end of your rope. So I hope that uh, people will listen to your plea. I, I think it is a fair one. Please uh, uh, give our thanks to all your colleagues. Uh, we have Mayor Durkin of Seattle. Mayor Durkin. Mayor Durkin. Thank you, Governor. Um, thank you for your leadership and for your introduction today. I remain grateful that you and our public health officials continue to understand the dangers of COVID-19 for our community. I have the honor of serving as one of uh, 11 mayors that sits on a global panel of mayors talking about global COVID recovery. There's no part of the globe, no part of this country that is immune to this disease. 
And we have been at the forefront here in Washington State, King County and Seattle and the other cities fighting this pandemic from the beginning. And I thank you and my fellow electeds for their leadership, but mostly I thank the people of our region and particularly for the city of Seattle because people have unselfishly, every time we've asked them to do something, done so. We all wish we were in a different place and that we did not have to take these actions today. I know that there is an unprecedented amount of um, complications and challenges that you face as governor, and I appreciate your leadership in this. We know you're doing this to save lives and that at every step of the way, we must speak as one as elected officials and public health officials. We also know, as you mentioned, how devastating, how devastating this virus has been for so many families, so many businesses, and so many workers. And we will double our efforts to try to address that as the governments. We know that as the original epicenter of COVID-19, we were the first to face this pandemic, and that you and other local officials standing up together helped us reach first flattening the curve and not ending up like some other places. Since the start of the pandemic, I wanna call out Seattle residents and businesses because they have been taking the public health guidance so seriously and their actions have saved lives. Of the largest 30 cities in America, Seattle has the lowest hospitalization per capita. We also have the lowest death numbers. When I think how terrible this year has been for so many, I think how hard it is to make these decisions to change the trajectory of this deadly virus. But we know what happens if we don't. Right now, there are cities with no ICU capacity. There are cities like El Paso, which is just slightly smaller than Seattle, that now has 10 refrigeration trucks using as morgues and 150 deaths since November 1st. This spring and summer, we all witnessed the horrific images of doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers at overwhelmed hospitals. I wanna thank Cliff and all the frontline healthcare workers for their devotion and their work. We all can make a difference for them. They are our first and our last defense. We owe it to them and to our communities to take steps. Together, we in Washington can make a difference. While we have one of the lowest rates of any major city, Seattle's not immune to the surge of this virus in our state and county either. Just in the last week, we have had more than 100, nationwide, we've had more than a million cases and 181,000 on Friday. In Washington state, as you mentioned, there's been record levels. And in Puget Sound, every county and city are seeing a rise. We looked at our own data and found that in Seattle, nearly 20% of total cases are just from the last two weeks. I wanna say that again, that means one out of every five cases of COVID for the seven month period is just from the last two weeks. And we know that the health and economic impacts of this virus have disproportionately hit our communities of color and our vulnerable communities. We're lucky that we've not seen the hospitalization that others have, but it is increasing in Seattle. This virus is surging everywhere. And that's why governor, I wanna thank you and all the nurses, doctors and public health officials who are doing so much to protect all of us. Acting today will mean saving more lives in the future. But as you noted, these new restrictions and these economic impacts are gonna be hard. These times have been devastating for so many, so many families and small businesses. People are hurting. There's no doubt that any restrictions will cause further economic impacts in Seattle and across our state. As Seattle implements these new restrictions from the state, we are committed to finding ways to support our small businesses, particularly our restaurants. In March, we launched the first in the nation small business grant program. We reopened that fund this past week and I will be exploring all options to increase that fund to help people on an emergency basis. And in the coming days, I'll also be proposing a small business relief package to include more assistance for small businesses, more flexibility for outdoor dining and other measures to help people through the holidays and the rest of the year. We have hundreds of businesses and restaurants using our curb space 
for takeout and other things, and we will continue to fast track those programs. Seattle will continue to provide direct financial aid to our workers and small businesses. We work quickly to launch the COVID-19 relief program, including rent relief, expanding shelter for people experiencing homelessness, grocery vouchers for working families, direct cash assistance for immigrants and refugees, and financial assistance for small businesses. Ultimately, Governor, we will rely on the state to provide as much emergency aid as we can, and all of us need the federal government to do its job and to step up and to immediately pass a COVID-19 re relief package that really meets the needs of our communities. We in government will continue to do all we can to really help through this virus, from the testing programs the city of Seattle has set up to the relief packages. I again want to thank you and your team. We know for every family out there that the coming weeks are going to be so difficult. It is a time we are used to getting together, and now we have to be apart. But this is how we will save lives and go into the future. I also believe that we will have a vaccine and that hopefully this time next year, we will be having a much different conversation and giving a much different kinds of Thanksgiving. This virus is unrelenting and our efforts to beat it have to be just as unrelenting. I wanna thank everybody who has done so much to get us to where we are. I wanna urge everyone in the city of Seattle, please show some love for your local businesses. Go and buy from your local restaurants and your local retail shops. This is the holidays, the time when they really rely on so much of that for their well-being and for their workers. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, thank you, uh, Madam, Mayor. Madam Mayor. I wanna thank all of your colleague mayors who've been so creative helping businesses with curbside delivery and takeout and outdoor dining. Uh, you've shown a lot of creativity to help these businesses and we need to redouble that. So thanks to all the mayors out there who've been working on that. And by the way, one comment, I know all of us would like to have sort of the financial aspects of this totally resolved uh, when we announced this today. Uh, uh, that's gonna take some work, but we had to get this done today, but because again, time is of the essence here. Uh, what we know is if you act early, you can save lives. And if you don't, you'll be swamped by a tsunami of this virus. We're acting early and appropriately, I believe. Dow Constantine, executive of King County, well, thank you, Governor. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate being invited to share a few thoughts this morning. You know, like everywhere in the state, our case counts are soaring, and that is also true nationally. Uh, the number of hospitalizations in King County last week increased by over 70% compared to the previous four weeks. In fact, it was just earlier this week uh, that I was reflecting that our hospitalizations had not increased dramatically. And then later that afternoon, I was informed that uh, we had seen a 30% increase in one day in hospital bed use. So uh, there are now twice as many people in local hospitals with COVID-19 uh, as there were just a month ago. This is the most critical issue. As has been mentioned, we have to reverse this trend before our hospitals become overwhelmed. We really need to reverse the trend before our, our essential workers, including nurses and doctors, fall ill and can no longer serve our community. And, and yes, thank you, Clint Wallace, for your service and uh, your really impactful words this morning. Every generation has faced sacrifices. This is our moment. But of course, this sacrifice is not evenly shared. It's difficult to imagine, but um, only members of our household will be able to gather at the Thanksgiving table this year. The relatives and friends we usually see at the holidays will be with us only by phone or by video. But this sacrifice, as personal as it feels, is minor compared to what many restaurateurs and retailers and other businesses and their workers face. We owe them, as was just mentioned, our patronage and we owe them financial assistance. We owe it to ourselves to preserve the jobs and the businesses that make our communities what they are. And I'm glad to hear about the additional aid that the governor has just announced. 
The governor's announcement this morning is the right thing to do under the dire circumstances we now face. I appreciate that for many local businesses, it means continued hardship. And for many residents, it means not only financial strain, but continued isolation. But these steps do appear right now to be necessary to bring this virus under control. And the more we do this together, the more we can take aggressive and collective action, the faster we can return to normalcy. Beyond the restrictions and the aid announced by the governor, King County is taking actions, including uh, currently hiring and onboarding 25 additional contact tracers to add to our core group of 70. Uh, we've already added four new test sites in South King County where the incidence rate uh, of coronavirus is twice that of King County as a whole. And we are pushing forward on adding even more test sites. We're launching a pilot um, to provide basic supports to the lowest income residents who must isolate or quarantine uh, because of coronavirus, but that may not be a viable option for them financially. We wanna make sure they don't have to go into work and risk infecting others. But that's paid for from COVID funds, and we locally are out of COVID funds. We need new federal resources for wage replacement and paycheck protection for, for rental assistance and food security for child care and behavioral health supports and of course for public health funding. This pandemic will not last forever and there is good news on the horizon with vaccines and I want to point out that people are really doing a good job following the public health guidance. People in Washington State, people in King County are being conscientious. 93% of Washingtonians are wearing masks in the appropriate circumstances. Despite the darkness of this winter, we have every reason to be optimistic that a brighter, sunnier day is ahead. But until that day, we have to act individually and collectively to save lives, to save health, physical health, mental health to save businesses and the cultural institutions that make our communities great places to live, and simply to take care of one another and to take care of this place we love. So let's take all the necessary steps, all the steps that we can to keep every person safe, to ensure that every person is able to get through to the other side. Thank you, Thank you, Dow. I appreciate, I appreciate working, working with you working on, with you on uh, these business plans yeah. along with the mayor and your colleagues. And I appreciate you saying, giving a shout out to the people who are helping. Look, our mass compliance has been really high in retail areas. This has been great. It's one of the reasons we've recently had it, 45 other states had more infections than we did. So we know that Washingtonians can do it. Uh, we just need up our game a little bit. With that, we have uh, uh, Dr. Diaz. Dr. Diaz, uh, Dr. Diaz, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Governor Inslee and Dr. Kathy Lofi for their leadership uh, through the pandemic. Uh, their policies and guidelines have kept Washingtonians safe uh, and have positioned us much better than many other states around the country. Uh, I have colleagues around the country where they're telling me that their hospitals are full, their ICUs are full. In many cases, they're transferring patients out of state to receive care. Uh, thankfully, the leadership here in the state has resulted in us being in a much better position overall than other states around the country. Uh, despite this, we are seeing significant rises in cases uh, and action is certainly warranted right now. Within Snohomish County, for example, despite many medical advances in treatment where we're saving more lives, uh, as well as advances in managing of, of COVID through telehealth, we're still seeing a rapid rise in hospitalizations in Snohomish County. We're also seeing deaths associated with hospitalization. And more importantly, we're also seeing a rapid rise in the number of people in the ICU. Many of these patients remain in the ICU for a prolonged period of time, uh, and they accumulate and quickly take up ICU beds. We're also seeing within our county that vulnerable populations are being affected disproportionately. We've seen large outbreaks within nursing homes in our, in our county, and also other communities, such as the Hispanic community, which has been very hard hit. 
right now without action, we may not be able to continue to offer uh, care for both COVID patients and offer uh, some medical services and non-urgent surgeries as well. Uh, it's critically important that we take action now to prevent this from happening. As mentioned before, we have really a heroic staff across the state with health workers who have stepped up to the challenge of the pandemic, but they are taxed. Uh, and these actions will hopefully provide relief to them. We do want to reiterate that it is important for patients to continue to seek care at hospitals. They are safe places to go. And we did see quite a few bad outcomes in the spring when people were delaying care for things like stroke and heart attacks. So we want people to continue to come to the hospital to receive care. These policies aren't going to be in place forever. And we're currently working closely with the Department of Health uh, to develop a plan for vaccine distribution, which will hopefully begin in the next month or two, and we can begin to vaccinate our population. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Dr. Diaz. The work the medical community is doing, I, I do want to note that because of the genius in the medical community, uh, the mortality of people who do go into a hospital has been reduced a few percentage points. But despite those, some of the improvements, uh, the fatalities are still going up rather markedly in the state of Washington. So we're going to try to keep uh, helping you outside the hospital as much as we can, uh, Dr. Diaz. I have some other comments before we turn to questions. Uh, one thing we hope that people realize right now is that we hope we don't have hoarding going on in, in, in our stores. Uh, uh, that is really not necessary and most unhelpful right now. Our supply chain is strong. Uh, buying up everything you can get your hands on really hurts everybody, and there's just no necessity of it right now. Because we've had some hardworking people who've been willing to stay in the agricultural industry, even in difficult times, we've got a good supply chain for food and things we need. So you don't need to shop uh, more often or in, in larger amounts. We also hope the Washingtonians can help uh, our local health officials. These folks are really doing some tough jobs right now. Look, these are hard decisions at the local level. And I hope people can show them support and respect. I know sometimes they, they, politics is intruded and they've been subject to a lot of pressure that is not helpful them to make science-based decisions. I hope people can support these folks in their professional duties. I just want to close before I take questions by saying this. Um, uh, look, these are dangerous days, but there is a light at the tunnel, uh, light at the end of the tunnel. It's just clear. Really good news so far in a vaccine, good news on therapy, better news on hospital uh, care. And so we will continue to fight and we will continue to adapt and persevere. It may be months until we're uh, in the clear, but advances are going on every day medically and we ought to celebrate that. Uh, but right now we need action. We need act action this day. You know, it was interesting. I was thinking about these decisions we're making. These are tough decisions because they have such profound ramifications on life itself and people's businesses. And uh, somebody asked me this morning, you know, how do you decide when to do things like this? And I remember talking to Dr. Fauci months ago about this. And he told me that if you're making decisions and they're really uncomfortable, uh, if, if they really seem overly burdensome, that's when you need to make them. Because if you wait till there's gurneys stacked up in the halls of the hospitals, it's just too late. So we're making decisions based on confidence, on being resolute, and I know we will continue to be vigilant because of this. And when you think about this, there is something that, you know, we should be thankful for among many blessings this year. And that is this is under our control. This is not like an earthquake that we can't stop or an asteroid or a giant flood. This is totally under our control. We decide whether we're going to get the COVID to some degree, or whether we're going to give it to someone else. Because we have the knowledge about how to avoid that, which is to avoid being inside, close to a person, breathing them on them for prolonged periods. We have the tools at our disposal. This is in our hands. We make a decision whether this is pandemic is going to swallow us whole. We make a decision whether we're going to eventually recover our economy. We make the decision whether we're going to show our loved ones that we really love them and by just avoiding these dangerous situations. So that's what we're doing today. We're demonstrating that love, and we're demonstrating the ability to use the tools we have, including our heads, to do things to save lives. Uh, I want to just close by saying, too, we're, 
we're, we're doing some restrictions today about economic activities. But maybe the most single most important message that I hope Washingtonians will embrace is that probably the most dangerous place in the state of Washington right now is in our own homes, on our couches, in our chairs, at our dining room tables. Because these are the places we're going to more often where we love to socialize, where we love to have people over for dinner, where we would look forward to a giant Thanksgiving dinner, where we'd love to have a Seahawks celebration. And it's so easy to become infected by the people you love or vice versa. It's so easy. I mean, I felt this my same way. I, you know, I was thinking about a guy I've known for 50 years, and you think, well, he's okay. He is okay. He's a great guy. But neither here nor I know whether he or I have COVID right now. And if I'm going to see him, it's going to be outside. So I hope people think about this in their decisions individually and their families. If we do, we're going to knock this pandemic down. With that, uh, happy to stand for questions. We also have Nick Struley, our Director of External Relations, who's uh, done yeoman work on this, uh, on these efforts. Any clarification on unemployment insurance? Uh, yeah, Tara, oh, yeah, Tara. just a clarification. Our state uh, unemployment insurance benefits will not run out, not our state portion. I just wanted to clarify that. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. With that, up first, we will go to Rachel with AP. Go ahead, Rachel. Governor, you and health officials had previously said that in-home gatherings are mainly to blame for these most recent increases. So why put additional restrictions on businesses that have already been requiring customer and employee masking and distancing? And then is there any enforcement plan related to the quarantine COVID test requirements for home gatherings? Uh, yeah, thanks uh, for those two questions. Um, look, we have, to, we have to reduce these transmissions any place we can. And the nature of your question, it, 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 this is not an exercise in culpability or guilt or even responsibility. Look, the business owners, the restaurant owners, they're not doing anything wrong having a restaurant. And we're not, this is not an effort to punish them. They're, they've been doing some really good work trying to reduce the risk associated with these businesses. So this is not a matter of trying to assign blame or respective responsibility. It's just that because of the combination of this virus and the winter, we have to identify every single environment where this transmission can take place. That certainly includes our homes, as I just alluded to, but it also includes restaurants, gyms, uh, businesses of, of, of a whole bunch of different natures, all kinds of social activity. So here's the scientific fact. We have to, to, to close this window of transmission, every window we can to close. And that's just a scientific fact. So it's not based on arguing about responsibility. It's arguing about how we're gonna save lives and this is a way to do it. Now I am hopeful that, that people in their individual lives in their homes help out as well because you're helping us recover our economy. If you avoid a dinner where you might be affecting someone, that's one step further to when we can restore a whole economic recovery. So we can all help each other in this regard. As far as enforcement, um, look, you know, you're not gonna expect state troopers coming to your door if, if you have a big Thanksgiving dinner. But by having a requirement legally, we do hope people who want to abide by the law, will abide by the law, which is to not have these unnecessary social interactions, which are, diff which are uh, dangerous right now. And we're hopeful that that will raise the consciousness of this issue. And we know scientifically it really works because we did it last spring. And the more of us do now going into the winter, the better off that we will be. Rachel, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Yeah, the state's hospitality association is estimating that 100,000 people could lose their jobs right before the holidays because of these restrictions. So can you talk a bit about the 50 million in federal aid that you discussed earlier? Is that money that's already in hand and how will that be used to offset these potential impacts? Yes, that is in hand and we just have to figure out the distribution mechanism. As, as I've indicated, it'll probably be grants and loans to businesses. 
But the employees, obviously, we're also super concerned about, and that's why we want to make sure that uh, the, the federal government acts to extend the federal part of unemployment insurance. We'd like to consider other measures of providing safety nets for these families with nutrition assistance. As you know, we've extended the eviction moratorium, but we in the upcoming days will be looking for other ways to support them. So uh, look forward to some other progress uh, in that regard. All right, up next, we'll go to David Gutman with the Seattle Times. Go ahead, David. And by the way, I should mention this. For standard unemployment insurance, so if you become unemployed tomorrow because of this or any other legitimate reason, that, that fund is solvent. The, the, the dollars are there to do this. People do not have to worry that the unemployment insurance suddenly would not be able to finance these benefits. They're, they're, that's not a problem. It is a stable system, so you don't have to worry about that. All right, David Goodman, go ahead. Uh, hi, Governor. Uh, two questions. One, do you have an estimate on how long these new restrictions and shutdowns will be in place? And two, um, what's the effect on these new regulations on on sporting events? Are we are the Seahawks and Huskies going to still be playing in Washington? Um, and if so, why? Yeah, th this uh, is four weeks. These restrictions are limited to four weeks. We would hope that we will have progress and that that would be the limit of these restrictions. Obviously, no one has any guarantees on that. But four weeks is about the minimal length of time where we would have a reasonable way of assessing whether this is having an impact or not. So it is our hope that it would be limited to four weeks. Uh, the sporting, this does not change in any way that I can think of at the moment, the Seahawks or the Cougars and Huskies uh, in, their, in their endeavors. David, did you want to ask a follow-up? Yeah, I mean, how, if you're asking people in their own outdoor gatherings to limit it to five people outside their household, um, why are we having professional football games with, with, you know, 50 people outside their household gathered together? Well, for one thing, these teams on the college and pro level have been able to demonstrate their rigorous protocols, including very rigorous testing, hygiene, that we think gives us a, a, a good degree of confidence it can be done safely. When you get into informal situations where you don't have anyone, you know, checking every day whether you've stayed in the bubble and whether you've done the testing, it's a very, very different uh, situation. Uh, Nick, would you like to address that at all? I think you covered it very well, Governor. The professional teams and the college teams have very rigorous plans that have been negotiated with their players' associations that involve very rigorous testing and, and lots of additional protocols. All right. Up next, up next, we'll go to Amy Moreno with King 5. Go ahead, Amy. Yes, Governor. I want to circle back to the issue regarding grocery stores. Um, you know, back in the spring, we saw long lines outside the stores, and now we are going into a difficult time of the year weather-wise. Uh, we had issues with seniors getting inside the stores, people with different disabilities. Was that weighed in in terms of putting that 25% restriction on capacity, uh, considering grocery stores aren't even in the top five in the outbreak data you guys have on the state website? Uh, did you consider that, you know, this could make it difficult for some people just to get to the grocery store if they're looking at a long line out in front? Yeah, this is not a change. They currently are limited to 30 percent of their capacity. It's gone from 30 to 25 percent. So this is a very minimal change. And that was done principally so that we have sort of equity across multiple endeavors and, and industries to have this 25 percent capacity. Uh, the reason we are not seeing at least identified outbreaks in stores is because we are doing these things of capacity limitations and masking and the like. And in grocery stores, you can wear a mask in your transaction with other shoppers or other people. This is the difference between grocery stores and restaurants, frankly. We have found that we can limit transmission dramatically in circumstances where you can keep your mask on. And this has been really, really fortunate for all of us. So I don't think that this should increase uh, lines uh, to any significant degree at all. Amy, did you want to ask a follow-up question? 
Yeah, one more question. We're seeing a lot of small businesses in our state shut down because they just can't hang on anymore. What kind of help is there for those small businesses that just can't make it anymore? Well, as we talked about, we've uh, today I've announced another $50 million that will be available for uh, small businesses in grants and loans. The exact nature of that and how to distribute that dollars, we're working on that. We'll have more to say about that in the upcoming days. So that's $50 million that is going to help some folks. But I don't, you know, don't want to think that's going to solve everybody's problem. The problem is much bigger than that. And that is one reason why we want to urge the Congress to act to restore that uh, Paycheck Protection Fund, to restore uh, grants to small businesses. It's absolutely critical. Look, the federal government has resources that dwarf any state, obviously. And they're able, frankly, to go into the bond market and, and borrow money so that we can finance this. And they definitely should do that. So all of us who feel, as I do, uh, the pain of the small business people uh, ought to be uh, pounding the doors of, of the Congress and, and the new president, who I'm glad we're going to have, to really get this job done. And, uh, but as I've said, we're going to do everything that we can do. Uh, and as I've also said, there are things we want to look at through other than in addition to the unemployment compensation system that will be there and, as I've said, is stable for employees. We're examining what we can do on the nutrition basis uh, or other methods uh, to help people out. All right. Up next, we'll go to Jim Camden with a spokesman review. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, Governor, what enforcement do you anticipate in, in areas of the state like Spokane when people can go across the state line uh, for to go to a restaurant, a bar, or other gathering places? Um, uh, what sort of restrictions or, or enforcement do you have for, for things like that? Well, obviously, I don't have jurisdiction in Idaho. I have urged the Idaho leaders to show some leadership. One of the reasons we have such jammed up hospitals in Spokane is because Idaho, uh, frankly, has not done some of the things that we have found successful. I was stunned at the same week where I heard that Idaho from Kootenai County may ship patients here to Oregon that they'd abandoned their mask requirement. That's just irresponsible. I, I don't know what else to say about it. So we hope Idaho over time will be more uh, aggressive and, uh, and responsible, frankly, to reduce the, the burden on the Spokane medical system. Uh, that's a hope. We're not going to have any border patrols on this. We have too many interrelationships of people crossing the border. We will have enforcement of businesses, obviously, in our jurisdiction uh, to make sure that they comply. Fortunately, we've had very, very good compliance with our businesses that are in the state of Washington. I'm very appreciative of that. But look, this is tough for business owners to have to comply with this. This is tough. And the huge majority of them have been doing this. We appreciate that. Jim, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Um, yeah. Um, as part of the aggressive and collective action that, that people are talking about, Will you bring the legislature uh, back into special session before the end of the year to, to try and work out some of these these ideas on assistance for, for businesses? And, and yeah, it is yeah. possible. We don't have any current plans to do this. As you know, we talked to the legislators about use of the CARES funding. I'm relatively confident we'll get the $50 million out. Um, if we come up with a new way of helping before January 1 that could get into place before then, uh, I wouldn't have qualms of asking people to come back, and I, and I believe they would. Right now, we don't have any plans to do this at the moment. All right. Up next, we'll go to Cole Miller with Como 4. Go ahead, Cole. Hi there, Governor. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, one question that I had was in regards to um, the employment, uh, our EDS. Uh, clearly, there were troubles with this system. Uh, as we saw some folks waiting 10, 12, 14 weeks to get uh, unemployment benefits. What can you do to assure folks who may be going back into that system or into that system for the first time that we won't see the backlog and headaches that we did this spring? Well, if we're successful in doing what we're calling for today and we can avoid a similar surge in unemployment associated with this pandemic, you know, we can give people confidence. But if this pandemic continues to run rampant, 
and we have to take more restriction act restrictive actions like we did in March. Our March stay at home off uh, order was much more restrictive than this and caused much more short term unemployment by orders of magnitude probably. So we're trying to avoid that. And so if this works, we'll be able to avoid that surge to take another step that would could cause more rampant unemployment. Now, uh, I take issue with one of the things you said, look, the problem here is not the department. The problem is the pandemic, the virus. The virus caused 10 times more people to need unemployment insurance overnight. It took months for the department to build up its capacity to answer that need. No business can ramp up by a factor of 10 overnight. They have ramped up dramatically their capacity. Uh, and there's sort of a, a stable uh, backlog at the moment that's not increasing. And they continue to try to use creative work to get that whittled down as far as humanly possible. So long and short of it, I don't think it'll be, uh, get significantly worse unless we had to go another step, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the direction reducing economic activity. But this is not, uh, I shouldn't say, it's not nirvana in that system because our numbers still are dramatically uh, higher, obviously, than, uh, than they were pre, pre-COVID. I will also say that, and this doesn't make anybody feel better, but it is a, a relevant fact, every state, virtually every state in the country is, has this problem um, because all of the states got hit with this you know, tenfold increase of cases. And as a result, they've all struggled with this. And we're going to do everything humanly possible and are. I'm actually meeting uh, the director of the department Monday to talk about some new creative ways we hope to even accelerate some of the adjudications. Cole, did you want, Cole, to, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Uh, thank you, Governor. Yes, just real quickly, um, if you could again touch on the four-week uh, restriction, is that's what we're looking at now, that four-week window. Uh, have the metrics changed at all for what you'll be looking at as to whether or not those restrictions will stay in place? or continue on? Or are we looking at the same metrics uh, that you announced um, earlier in the year? Well, I don't, I mean, I'm, we're not announcing different metrics today. So there's nothing I can tell you will change at the end of four weeks. We hope that this will demonstrate a reduced rate of increase in the infection at a minimum. We hope that we will achieve that. that that's the metric that we will be looking at. All right, up next, we'll go to Sarah Gensler with McClatchy. Go ahead, Sarah. All right, thank you, Governor. Um, I understand the broad logic behind the restrictions themselves um, and how that's based on science. And under these rules, there will still be some local control for K through 12. So can you specifically speak to the logic of shifting from a county by county approach to a statewide action for the other restrictions? Yes, what we what we have found is that the the pandemic is broad enough in enough places, east, west, north and south, that if we just tried to do this on a county by county basis, there was not enough difference, if you will, in the proximity. These centers are close enough that you end up not being able to have any sort of effective uh, reduction of social activity or, or, or interactions, bottom line. And that's frustrating because there are differences from, you know, one precinct to another, one zip code to another. I'll give you an example. Um, South King County has a much higher rate of infection than the central northern part of King County. And, you know, in the abstract, you could have tighter restrictions in South King County and looser in North King County or Central King County. But that means people just drive, you know, one zip code over that's only a mile away, and you just can't really parse out in a jigsaw puzzle way this state, given how broad-based this infection is. And as the, could you put a, that chart up again of the country? I'm gonna ask Sam to put up this chart, showing the infections rates in the United States. You know, when we started this, and we were the first hit, of course, we'd have these little nodes, these little pockets, and we could defend against it. And that was also true within the state. We had you know, higher rates in one place than another. And we could sort of really jump on those nodes. Now it's just much more diffuse and changing very rapidly. And the rapidity of this thing is stunning to me. Look, I study this, you know, 
like I breathe since this started. And, you know, three weeks ago, we were in a relatively stable position, or four weeks ago, and there was a good reason to hope that this surge would, would not be something catastrophic, and boom, it just hit us like bricks. I mean, we went from, you know, I'd get up in the morning and see our daily numbers of 600 just a few weeks ago, and I was 2,200 this morning. So this is an explosive situation that we are in, and when you have an explosive fire, you've got to respond anywhere those embers can land, and those embers are landing all over our state right now. Sarah, did you, Sarah, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Oh, just real quick. What is the then difference between that and schools? Is it that they're hyper, more hyper-local or um, why, yeah, why the difference in the approach there? Because schools have been historically a local control decisions by local school boards and local communities. And we have respected that decision-making of local communities. We have given recommendations. We have tried to share science with them. Now, I will say one other thing as well, um, and I think there's an emerging science of schools, and again, this is not totally clear cut, but it does appear that numerous schools are being able to show, to the surprise of many, uh, a way to have particularly younger students in on-site education that has not resulted in broad-sped communicable uh, transmission. And and, and the reason is they've been able to find a way not to have students talking to one another without masks like happens in restaurants. And they have found a way to spread students out, maybe have hybrid programs. And we've had a number of districts that have been quite successful in the state in this regard. So we did not believe it was in our uh, place to, to close those down. All right, up next, we'll go to Deborah Horn with Cairo 7. Go ahead, Deborah. Good morning. Good afternoon, morning. Governor. Um, thanks for holding this conversation so that we can talk about this. I do have a couple of questions. We're being asked, um, what about manufacturing jobs and construction? I guess the main question is, you've left out a lot of entities, manufacturing, construction, my having my hair done, uh, that sort of thing. Are those places that are not going to be affected by this? And what is the reasoning as to why not? Uh Really important questions. Basically, we, we had sort of two choices, not three. No action, that was not an option. So we didn't seriously consider that. The other was to do what we did in March that did address um, most of those entities that you talked about. Uh, we decided to not go down that route because we wanted to have, as much as we can, reduced economic dislocation for families and businesses. And bottom line is we thought by addressing the, 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 the businesses where you, you, by necessity, you had unmasked interaction inside with close uh, uh, work or, or, or transmission going on, we thought there's a reasonable chance that if we just deal with that type of environment where people by necessity are in that kind of environment, where you're either close, you're unmasked, you're breathing hard for a length of time, that we have a reasonable chance of reducing this rate of this transmission. If we can do that without more laid off construction workers or barbers or hairstylists, we thought it was worthwhile to, to go that route. And that's the decision we made. We hope that it succeeds. Uh, you know, if it doesn't, we'll, we'll have to look at other alternatives. Now, I will say you mentioned construction. I want to say this to the folks, leaders in the construction industry. Um, we have had uh, some transmission on, we believe, in some construction sites, and we are not getting as much compliance as we need in the construction industry. And I would uh, advise people in the construction industry, we're going to be watching this very closely in the next several weeks. We need you to comply with the protocols. That includes masks, it includes hygiene. We need you to comply. We will be watching this in the next several weeks. We hope that we will get better compliance so we don't have to consider other measures in construction. All right, Deborah, did you wanna ask a follow-up question? I would like to, if I may. I guess it goes along with 
action of enforcement. As you know, Governor, uh, despite your best efforts and the best efforts of all of the people on this call, there are still people in this state who don't believe that COVID-19 is an issue. Certainly it has not been one for them. And, and perhaps it has not been one for them, for those they love. Uh, what can, how can you address that through the actions that you're taking right now? Uh, important question. Uh, you know, you can do all you can do, and that's what we're doing. Uh, I don't have a switch to throw that can, you know, uh, can, you know, convince people what I want to convince them. I can do everything I can do, and what we're doing is sharing science with them. We are encouraging people to be leaders themselves. You know, I'm not the only, hopefully, well, I know I'm not the only leader in the state of Washington. I may be governor, but I'm not the only leader. Everybody's a leader here. And one of the things I can do is to encourage people to encourage to be leaders in their own families. You know, one of what you everybody can be a leader here who celebrates Thanksgiving to have a discussion with your family about how you're going to celebrate Thanksgiving this year. Everybody can be a leader in that regard. And I'm encouraging people to be leaders. Have that conversation. Think about it. Uh, talk to your 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 family about it. Uh, that's one way I can help out. Because frankly, uh, family members are going to be a lot more persuasive than I am on this subject. And I encourage those conversations. Um, and the one thing I would say is, yes, there's going to be people, we're a diverse state. We have di diverse parties and beliefs. But the fact that someone is not um, complying with common sense and, and healthy behavior shouldn't reduce our uh, uh, commitment to, to being healthy and responsible. It should increase it, frankly. So even though we know this is not going to be 100%, nothing's ever going to be 100%, I don't think that should dissuade us from doing what we can under our control. And as I've said, this is under, this is under our control. Um, and I know this is really hard, but Trudy, who I thought was quite persuasive uh, talking about Thanksgiving the other day, this morning, she, she heard this, uh, oh, it was an interview or commercial somewhere, and it had a guy posing as a grandfather in 2060 and, and telling his grandchild what the year 2020 was like. And the, the grandchild was saying, well, did you, did you march in the beaches of Normandy or did you, you know, fight in the, the whatever war? And, and the grandfather, looking back, says, I did everything that was asked of me. And the grandchild said, what was asked you? What did they ask you to do? And he said, nothing. I was asked to do nothing. <laughs> Nobody asked me to storm the beaches of Normandy. Nobody asked me to give blood. I just had to find a way not to infect other people. And I was able to do that. And uh, yeah, this is hard, but I think it's something we can do. Do you have questions? Yeah, we've got three more. Um, up next, we'll go to Melissa Santos with Prescott. Go, go ahead, Melissa. Hi there, um, Governor Inslee. We saw uh, JT Wilcox, the House Minority Leader, has already said that House Republicans are ready to come back in a special session to pass more relief for businesses. Is that something you're considering at all um, at this point to call some special session of the legislature to pass relief for um, businesses and others in the state? We will be exploring all options to help businesses and employees and everyone else affected by this. I don't have a current plan other than the $50 million specifically that I proposed in a revolving loan fund that we're working on. Uh, but those may not require a special session. We might be able to do some of these things just by executive action. So at the moment, we're not, uh, we don't believe that's necessary. But if it is necessary, we can do that. And I'll be talking to legislators, including Representative Wilcox, about any ideas he has about that. Now we'll have to find well, a way to finance these things. We don't print money, unlike Washington, D.C. So um, people who do want to do this, we need them to help us figure out how to finance this. And that sometimes is a challenge. Melissa, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Yes, I would. Um, uh, we, I heard about enforcement measures for the uh, requirements on social gatherings, but what about um, for restaurants and others? Are you planning on ramping up enforcement for businesses um, compared to what we've seen in the past at this point for these new restrictions? 
We are not planning on that. We are hopeful that we've had, we will have business leaders complying with the law as we have, and it's been very gratifying. The vast, vast majority of business leaders have acted uh, responsibly and had and made some really tough decisions, and, and we very much have appreciated that. So we've had some enforcement action. We will be willing and able to take that if a restaurant stays open and, and uh, you know, and, and if we, we ask them to come into compliance and they refuse, you know, probably not going to have their liquor license very much longer. Um, but those have been rare events, and I'm very appreciative of that. All right. Got time for two more. Up next, we'll go to Austin Jenkins with Northwest News Network. Go ahead, Austin. Hi, Governor. Um, it was just, I think, about six weeks ago or five weeks ago that you increased um, the allowed table size at restaurants from six in some places, even eight in other places. So now, a month or so later, um, you're shutting down restaurants. The industry says it's responsible for fewer than one half of 1% of COVID cases. Um, and they don't, they don't believe that they're contributing to this problem and that they're disproportionately affected by this. And I'm sure many of those restaurant owners would have preferred to stay at four tops if it meant they could stay open through the holidays. Why such draconian action? Why not ease back and adjust back and give them a, a, a chance to stay open? Because we know a, a couple things. Number one, uh, taking action as we did. We have done this before and it had an impact. It dramatically reduced the transmission. We know this works. One of the reasons we're doing this is because we know it can work. Don't tell me that this doesn't work and that there's not transmission in restaurants. These things we did jointly worked. And the proof was in the pudding. When we did them, when we reduced the incidence of people being close together in multiple environments, all of which in some total gave us this massive infection rate, everything where you're talking close to a person, you're not wearing a mask for a prolonged period of, period, a period of time inside, is a contributing factor to this transmission. Now, no one knows the exact percentages of this because we don't, do a, we don't have a computer chip in everyone and, and be able to track every source of outbreak. We do know of the outbreaks we have been able to evaluate, the, the highest uh, industrial participation on that have been restaurants. We do know that. We do know that in some research done by Google that people um, who go to restaurants have had something like twice as higher level of transmission than those who do not. And they've been able to track that uh, through some of the Google information looking at cell phone data. We know as a scientific fact that is undisputable that when you do sit close to someone and breathe on them, that's a transmission risk. And every part of those transmissions plays some part in this. And so everyone has a role in this who creates those kind of opportunities, which includes people at home. Now, one of the things I think the restaurateurs who deserve our respect and our empathy here because they have done, I think, yeoman service trying to reduce the risks. They've been creative. They've been diligent in most, most circumstances, trying to help their employees be safe. They've moved tables around. You know, they, they, look, this is not anything that, that we should say they've been dilatory about. And they're frustrated because they're not the only place the transmission is taking place. More of them are probably taking place in the home because we have more social interactions in our homes probably than restaurants. But the fact is we have in virtually every circumstance that has that type of environment, we are now asking people to reduce their transmissions, including in homes, including in, in, uh, in gyms and bars and restaurants and other places. So they're not being singled out they are one of a group of good Washingtonians who are doing their best, whose current business model is not consistent with saving thousands of lives in our state. And that's why we made the decision. Now, on the, the change from a month or two ago, look, this is just a slippery beast, this COVID. As I said, a month and a half ago, we were in a relatively good position, right? And we were concerned about a fall surge, but we were hoping it wouldn't happen. Well, it has happened. And frankly, other states have not acted. 
And as a result, they have, they have semi-trucks with ice uh, because they don't have any space in their morgues. They're canceling surgery so you can't get your knee fixed or your, or your heart surgery because there's no room in the hospital, because they didn't take early action this way. So we've decided to take early action, and it is a difficult decision, believe me. Austin, did you, Austin, did you want to ask a follow-up? Uh, yeah, just briefly on the vaccine. I know the state is developing a vaccine distribution plan, but the New York Times had a headline, I think, yesterday saying that generally states are not equipped to distribute this vaccine. Um, I also heard a physician raising concerns about the West Coast states saying that they want to do their own vetting of the vaccine and that that will delay distribution even further. So I want to ask you to address Washington's level of preparedness to get this out and distributed when it's available and this extra layer of, of review that's been contemplated and how that might actually serve as a delay factor. Not going to serve as a delay factor, I can assure you. Uh, they will make a decision within a day or two of any federal uh, clearance of, of the uh, vaccine. And the reason they will be able to do that is because they will be able to, looking at, at essentially in real time as the clinical trial data comes in, they don't have to just open up the, the book on day one. They, they're going to be looking at this all as the system moves forward. So they will be able to make a decision within hours or a couple days. I'm confident of that. As far as the vaccine distribution system, there is a whole lot of work to do. And frankly, uh, we have been uh, uh, st not totally stymied, but I am concerned that, that the federal government is, is now being um, hampered in its ability to really identify the distribution system because there isn't a working relationship with the new administration, and that is hurting us right now. It is delaying the ability to get this vaccine distribution system up and running. Uh, I think that our state is in as good as any other state in this regard, but we have to have some federal decisions. Now, we also have to know which vaccine we're going to be distributing. This is one of the difficult situations. Um, so I'm looking forward to better federal guidance. Uh, by the way, Kathy, would you like to add anything to this or the previous question about about, um, you know, why restaurants? Would you like to add anything? Um, sure. So first of all, in terms of the vaccine distribution, um, our planning has going, is going along really well. We are in the process of enrolling providers um, who, will, who want to participate in the program and administer vaccines uh, to their patients or their staff. Um, so that is all underway. Um, and then in terms of the actual distribution, you know, the federal government is contracting with like major uh, medication dis distribution companies to actually directly ship the vaccine uh, to the clinics and the hospitals that are going to use it. Um, so we just have to, you know, and we need to enroll providers. Um, and then we select in, in the system if there's a limited number of, you know, vaccine doses available. We, um, you know, at the state will decide where to ship them first. Um, so logistically, you know, a lot of that distribution pro process is being, um, uh, you know, taken on by the federal government, um, which is great. So we don't have to, you know, worry about receiving a bunch of vaccine here in the, some state storage and then uh, alloc allocating it out and, and sending it to clinics. That will all be done through a national distributor. Um, I think the only thing I'll add about the restaurant discussion is that um, I just want to say that public health doesn't really have the ability to, um, to, to really understand how many people are infected in a lot of these restaurant outbreaks. Um, so as the governor mentioned, uh, restaurants are the most common site of outbreaks. Um, here in our state. Um, if you look a little deeper into the data, the number of people identified in those outbreaks are very small, and they're mostly, um, you know, and involve a lot of staff. And the reason is, is because that's who public health is focusing on. We're, we're focusing on transmission to staff. We don't have a really good idea to understand how many people who were at the restaurant when the, when the employee was sick could have been infected. 
So we would have to go back and figure out somehow through receipts who was actually at the restaurant when workers there were sick. And then we'd have to follow up with all those people that were at the restaurant and that's not happening. So we don't really have um, a way to sort of understand that piece of the situation. Um, and then and additionally, if there's a, a patron who is ill at a, at a restaurant, um, we would have a very difficult time. And there was a, another patron from a different party who was sitting at the table next to the ill you know, patron. We would have a very difficult time in our system um, being able to connect those two cases to the same setting. We have hundreds of people interviewing cases. Um, our data systems are not set up to be able to say this person was at rest restaurant X for X day and another patient get entered as this patient was in restaurant X that day and the system, uh, you know, and to have the system make that connection. We do not have the ability to do that. Um, so I think people need to understand that there are lots of limitations um, to the data. Um, we're sharing as much as we can. We want to be fully transparent about every, uh, you know, every piece of data we have, but there are just some really some, some underlying, major underlying sort of limitations um, in the data that we do share around outbreaks. Yeah, I want to add something to that. I, what I hear Kathy saying is that in this case, you know, absence, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And so you can't reach any conclusion. It would just be scientifically totally wrong to say we're not having transmissions in restaurants. Now, we don't know exactly what percentage that is, but it's kind of like, you know, how relevant that is, I'm not sure how relevant it is. You know, when I throw a pop can out the window, I'm one-tenth of one millionth of percent of the pop cans that I litter. But I still shouldn't do it. And what we're saying is it is too dangerous right now for Washingtonians in any environment to be sitting across the table for one another who is not in your household, who's not been tested, who has not been quarantined. In any circumstance, it is too dangerous to be doing that right now, even if it's only one house or one restaurant. That's essentially what we're saying. And if Washingtonians will embrace that position, we're gonna get on top of this pandemic. And if we don't, we're gonna have hospitals looking like El Paso in a few weeks. And that's just not acceptable. Final question. All right, final question. We'll go to Hannah Scott from Cairo Radio. Go ahead, Hannah. Hi, Governor. The, during the original lockdown, the people who work in restaurants and bars, a great many of them that I spoke to were only able to survive that because of unemployment, the extra unemployment that came from the federal government, which is no longer here. What, if anything, can the state do to help mitigate that? Might it include an extension of the eviction moratorium? And a, an extension of the eviction moratorium, as you know. And it may be possible, as I've indicated, we're giving some thought, could there possibly be a state substitution for the federal dollars? That is a very, very large number to do that. And we would have to be very creative on how to finance that because as you know, we already have a four and a half billion dollar hole in our budget already. So we would have to find a creative way to find the dollars to do that that are not anywhere close to the kitty right now. Nonetheless, we're thinking about things like that. But obviously the most effective thing is to have Congress extend those benefits. They can do so, there is a well-worn path to do so uh, that will keep this economy afloat. And I do wanna to suggest to the Congress too, this is not just a matter of empathy or compassion for these families, although it is. It's a matter of whether our economy is gonna continue and not have a significant collapse. We just, you know, it has been, propped up, the liquidity in the economy has come from the federal government, and they would be really making a mistake to assume that we're not for very difficult times if that just collapses, which it will without further federal action. So I can't overstate how important it is for the federal government to act. And we can all do our part talking to our legislators about that. Hannah, did you, Hannah, did you want to ask a follow-up? I know that we have a four-week end date on these current restrictions you're announcing today, but if you don't get the compliance that you're looking for specifically with indoor gatherings in the homes, and we do see 4,000 cases two weeks from now, would you anticipate taking more action two weeks from now? I've, I've always tried to avoid answering questions like that 
you know, sort of hypothetically, but obviously we can't see the total collapse of the healthcare system. We can't accept thousands and thousands of deceased Washingtonians. We know that further restrictions could be possible. Obviously, I'm not, a, I'm not saying it's probable, likely, but we know that we can't accept the pandemic uh, destroying our families. That, that we know, that's what I can say. But as I've said here, that should not be necessary. This is in our control. We have a path to health, both economically and physically, if we just take it. And I'm, I'm blowing the horn here and asking Washingtonians to join this effort. And the more people who join this effort uh, and start making decisions in their individual capacity, the less likely those things uh, will be necessary. And I'm seeing even just the last few days of more people sort of thinking about these things. Um, since Trudy and I addressed the state a few days ago, I've had any number of people say, geez, you know, I really, I hadn't thought about that, right? What could be bad about Thanksgiving? I, I get that. But I've had several friends just come up and say, uh, yeah, look, I'm rethinking this. We're, you know, we're not gonna have a big dinner. We're gonna do this virtually or something and have turkey sandwiches later virtually. So I do think there is a good chance for our state to, to rouse itself and confront this challenge in ways that we have in the past. Because we have done it in the past, we know we can do it and we know it will work. So I remain optimistic today, even in the matter of uh, where we are. We, we still have a lot to be thankful for. Can you wrap up, Governor? No, I just want to thank everyone. This has been a long discussion and a very important subject. I know we'll have more discussions. I wish everybody well. Good luck. Please be healthy.